becomes a bit of a disturbance. Okay, now we are on record. Okay, good morning to all of you. Hope everybody is keeping in good health. Uh, right now, the standard operating procedures for COVID appropriate behavior has been extended to 28th February. I think all of you must have got that notice from our director. That letter has come and actually it is not a director's decision. It is a decision from the ministry, from the highest level. So they have decided to continue with the appropriate COVID behavior, which means you still have to follow out the standard operating procedures in view of the COVID pandemic till 28th February. So there is no scope of your, everybody coming in to campus before 28th February. But yesterday, the 2017 entry batch, 94 boys have completed their first practical training. And I think today or tomorrow, today's Friday, so Saturday, Sunday, Monday morning, the new batch, new group of boys, about 90 or the boys will be coming in. And uh, they will start their practical training. So there is no thought about 2018 entry batch doing their practical classes. So your fourth semester results are still going to be delayed. And I don't know how to get around to it because I am not able to open my mouth in front of NYK. So that's become a bit of a problem. If I have to open my mouth, I have to tell them that yes, you're getting your fourth semester results and they can start the interviews. So unless that result is out, I cannot tell them anything, cannot invite anybody, I'm also stuck. So that's the situation for me also. So we, I think everybody has been delayed and unless the, your senior back get their practical training, you will not be coming into the picture. That's the way it is. And we cannot accommodate most, more students inside the campus or maybe they will make some engine. I asked Krishnandu Das to accommodate 35 boys. He said he will think, he will try, he will get the approval, then only he can do it. But they have to follow out DG shipping norms. Moment you disobey them, they will disrecognize or derecognize your um, course curriculum. They will not consider that practical class has been done sincerely. It has to be done with their standard operating procedures followed in Toto. That's the way it is. Okay, let's go back. Excuse me. Uh, yes, yes, what is it? Sir, what is the scenario of exam, sir? Because six semester classes are in continuation and we are uh, focusing on it. We are uh, a little bit uh, being confused about six semester exam will happen uh, offline or online. They have said in mid-February they will do. Now the examination is also a very, very tricky subject. They have probably tried to outsource the whole question session or, or examination session. And the questions will be partly multi-choice questions, partly short questions and partly long answer questions. Now this is being given to an outsourced body. And that is not getting ready quickly because this is the first time they are ever doing it. So tentative decision was middle of February or second week of February. But that also I have not been able to get an absolute positive response from anybody in the office yesterday. I had been to office yesterday and in the process I could not take section A and B classes. But I tried to find out what has been done but everything seems to be a little undecided. There is no absolute positivity in when the exam will be held, but the tentative dates were given as middle of February. So second week of February, we hope it comes through because you have finished your fifth semester syllabus, you are already on your sixth semester and your examination will be on fifth semester which is no doubt a little tough on you fellows because you have to be focused on your sixth semester while appearing for an exam for fifth semester. It is going to require a good amount of effort on your part, but I am sure you will do well because there will be a lot of leeway given to accommodate you for these examinations. So 
do not neglect your studies while you are in your sixth semester because if you have done your fifth semester reasonably sincerely i don't think you should have any problem and the questions that will be asked of you will be very very you know very with the intention of you being able to answer so i hope everything comes through but when it will come through it is depend on the ministry until they give the clearance or your state government also cannot give take decisions it is not a monopoly of the state government it is a uh, directive from coming right from the ministry unless they give a clearance we cannot do anything and right now the yesterday's notice was that the standing standing operated operating procedure sop has been extended till 28th of february so this month or rather next month it will be still online classes till 28th of february thereafter i pray and hope we get back to a norm normal way of doing things that's the way it is from your part you have only to revise what you have done in your fifth semester and keep going along in your sixth semester because we need to finish it also in time you cannot keep delaying 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 then you get one year back year back everybody will get so we need to show dg shipping that we are continuing with our active classes so that they allow us to get our boys for shipboard training within that stipulated time and not delayed any further so it's a very difficult situation but we have to go with it we have no choice so where were we last did we discuss uh, this i am sure we have done how the fuel coming into the uh, chamber is being discharged or delivered to the fuel injector and as the helix comes in line with the spill curve, spill passage the spillage takes place and end of injection takes place ranjit i did we do this pratham yes sir we finish this so, so we finish the next? slide number 15 16 okay 15 15 okay 15 was here we did up to here yes sir okay and before this was the different designs of the plunger this was the standard design this is another design and this is similar to the one that is number 2 that means instead of having a normal slot and a annular space you simply have a groove and this functions as well as this does this is usually in the smaller pump and this is usually in the larger pump and this was the diagram shown to you as a complete unit with all the parts assembled and you don't need to mug up all the parts this is being shown to you because the actual pump is not being displayed to you right now because we are online the day we get a chance to go to the workshop we will have that pump displayed in detail with all the parts dismantled and i will make you assemble the whole pump once you know how to assemble the pump you will understand the working of the pump even better okay so let's go on to our uh, next plate and here is the definition of the three strokes which are generally asked during any examination or oral interviews what is total stroke of a bosch fuel pump what is idle stroke of a bosch fuel pump and what is effective stroke of a idle of a bosch fuel pump you see a lot of boys make the mistake of saying it is the stroke when this 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 happens it is not when always stroke is considered as a distance a distance traveled by the plunger so you must in your definition include the word distance okay so here total stroke of the fuel pump is the distance the plunger travels from bottom to top of its working stroke all right so that is the absolute correct definition of stroke because stroke indicates distance it is also the difference between the radii of the peak circle and the base circle of the cam which works the pump everybody knows what the cam looks like 
the cam has a base circle and the tip of the peak also if it is formed in a circle then it is the difference in the radii of the cam peak to the cam base circle so that distance is the total stroke at which the pump works because at all times the lower part of the plunger is in contact with the roller and the roller is in contact with the cam it is not that the plunger is directly being pushed by the cam below the plunger you have a tappet tappet is a housing which holds a wheel and that wheel is called a roller so this roller rests on the cam of course in the diagram it is not shown but that is how it is i will show you in the next diagram how it works on the cam okay so that is what is the total stroke idle stroke is the same as the total stroke but with the vertical slot on the plunger off off the plunger not on the plunger it should be off off the plunger off the plunger now who is come to class himansh mukherjee hey this mukherjee is very late next time he is not going to come in okay the idle stroke is the same as the total stroke but with the vertical slot of the plunger in line with the suction port where is the vertical uh, slot yeah this is the vertical slot this part of the plunger it becomes in line with the slot all right so that vertical slot of the plunger in line with the suction port no fuel is delivered by the pump or injector during the stroke that means the plunger can go up and down but there will be no fuel injected so when does this happen okay this happens when the engine is running at a reasonably good speed or even slow head and suddenly you want to stop the engine if you stop the engine it means you move the fuel rack so the plunger turns immediately with the slot in line with the spill port the momentum of the ship momentum of the propeller continues to rotate the crankshaft if the crankshaft continues to rotate the camshaft will also continue to rotate if the camshaft continues to rotate the plunger will keep being moving up and down all right but that is the time we don't want any fuel injection so that is the time the plunger is rotated in such a way that the slot comes in line with the spill port so the plunger will continue to reciprocate and gradually come to a stop but during that period there will be no fuel injected and the engine will actually come to stop if you simply do not rotate the plunger and you want the engine to stop it will never happen because the fuel will keep being injected you are not that is the only way to cut off the fuel to the engine okay in the modern engines what they have done they have put a puncture valve on the discharge of the plunger that means above the delivery valve there is a puncture valve and this puncture valve is pneumatically or electrically operated and if you want to shut down the engine you just press a button in the control stand the moment you press that button that puncture valve opens so even if the plunger is rotated with maximum fuel and it is injecting fuel to the fuel injector that puncture valve will open the delivery side to a discharge line and this discharge line will be collected in a separate tank or container or something so no matter even if the delivery pressure of 350 bar is made that pressure will not be allowed to go to the injector because a bypass will be have been created so that is the way these modern engines are shut down if you do not have a puncture valve how will you cut off the fuel i have told you also with the help of a spanner you simply rotate a stud from end appearing from the pump and this locks the roller in position in an upward direction so the cam can keep rotating but it will not make contact with the roller so the roller moves with the cam as the cam keeps rotating so once it moves and a lever comes in the way it stops the roller from coming down onto the cam that is how you cut off the fuel but the modern engine they have what is called a puncture valve so that is your idle stroke and the most important stroke is called the 948 now no more he is the last boy 
up to a certain time period is possible or beyond that time period it becomes a disturbance so the effective stroke is the distance traveled by the plunger during actual delivery of fuel into the combustion chamber okay it is part of the total stroke all right it is the length from the top edge of the plunger to the point on the helix which opens the spill port i have shown you in that diagram also that it is the distance from the no not this one this one yeah it is the distance from the top edge of the plunger to the point on the helix which opens the spill port so at some time this effective stroke might be the small little one it may be this middle sized one it might be a bigger one it depends on the load on the engine in other words if the engine is consuming more fuel for every stroke then the stroke length of the effective stroke of the plunger will be somewhere in this region so more fuel gets discharged how more fuel is discharged because this being the effective stroke multiplied by the cross sectional area of that barrel internal diameter will be the volume of oil actually delivered into the combustion chamber so if the stroke is large then the quantity of oil becomes more if the stroke is small then the quantity of oil delivered is less so that's how you indicate low load and high load maximum load okay sorry yeah so the effective stroke is the distance traveled by the plunger during actual delivery of the fuel into the combustion chamber it is the length from the top edge of the plunger to the point on the helix which opens the spill port so i hope everybody understands the difference between total stroke idle stroke and effective stroke of a bosch fuel pump so at this sorry this, sorry effective guess, stroke once more effective stroke is the stroke is the distance traveled by the plunger during actual delivery of the fuel into the combustion chamber if you during the stroke of the plunger it is not that from bdc to tdc of the plunger that the fuel will be delivered into the combustion chamber that does not happen that is total stroke from bdc to tdc movement of the plunger is the total stroke only part of this total stroke is the effective stroke and this effective stroke can vary it can vary from a very small effective stroke to a very large effective stroke depending on the load on the engine that means how much fuel the engine is consuming per stroke or if it is at higher rpm or lower rpm okay now <clears throat> this stroke can be varied and even though the plunger may be moving up the fuel will not be injected why because by that time the helix of that plunger will have opened the spill port moment the spill port is opened then the pressure above the plunger is allowed to be released and moment that pressure is released there is no pressure to lift the injector fuel injector needle valve got the idea yes sir okay let's move on to our next area of subject person has got a question so what will happen if the fuel lag gets stuck at one position yes it happens it definitely happens how will we rectify the problem of oil spillage and engine stopping why will there be a spillage spillage means if the oil spills into the spill line it will be a pipeline which will lead to a normal manifold from the manifold it will go to the mixing tank there are time now this is another part this is the you know technical part of the whole issue that pratham has asked if the fuel rack gets stuck okay the fuel rack may get stuck in a increased fuel position or it may get stuck in the shutdown position if it gets stuck in the increased position that becomes a little dangerous you see all the fuel racks of all the engines they are connected with a spring onto one common lever and that lever is directly communicated to the governor so the 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 spring allows the fuel rack to remain stuck in one position while it is able to control all other fuel racks movement depending on the governor movement if the governor moves all the fuel rack and one fuel rack gets stuck in that position 
there is a possibility of excess that particular unit getting overloaded while the other units are all low. For this, you have to be keeping watch and you have to be aware. Of course, modern modern engines they have sensors fitted all over, so immediately an alarm will come. Number six unit overloaded. So immediately go and check that the fuel rack is cut. It happens. There are times it happens. But mercifully, I have not faced it, but I have got reports on such. So that is why maintenance of equipment is a necessity. In other words, where the fuel rack is working, you are supposed to have it well lubricated. There are arrangements to have it lubricated, and it's a very smooth fit. It is very, very rare for a fuel rack to get stuck if it has been working for a long duration. More it works, better it remains. But if the engine has been shut down for months and then you start working it, then there is a possibility of sticking parts unless you lubricate all those parts and ensure that they are free. Otherwise, nothing will happen. It will get engine will get overloaded. That unit will get overloaded momentarily, and then you go and rectify it immediately. Sir, up to what amount there is rise in fuel pressure by this fuel pump? Up to what amount? It's a positive displacement pump. It can raise the pressure to 1,000 bar also. These are positive displacement pumps, and they will either rupture the pipe if there is no release. You cannot have one end of it closed because that pump is capable of building a pressure to 1,000 plus. And if that happens, the pipeline is going to rupture. It is going to fail. So the fuel pressure by a positive displacement pump can rise to hydraulic pressures, any level, 1,000 bar also. That's the, why the pump is. Uh, what amount there is a rise? By what amount? Any amount, up till the amount the fuel injector spring releases. That is why we set the spring at a certain pressure, 350 bar. So when the fuel pump pressure rises, rises, it will keep rising to 1,000 bar also. But moment it rises to 350 bar, then the needle valve in the fuel injector will give way and open, and then the pressure is delivered. Then, of course, the pressure will drop. Okay. Sir, can it be said that the length of the effective stroke is directly proportional to the efficiency of the engine? No, no, no. Efficiency of the engine and effective stroke has got no relationship. You can't relate. Efficiency of the engine has got other matters, lots of other matters to be taken care of. You cannot say effective stroke is directly proportional to the efficiency. No. You can say the effective stroke is proportional to the load on the engine. That's all. More, the larger the effective stroke, more the load on the engine. Efficiency and load as an effective stroke has no relationship. Okay. Good that you ask and get your um, concepts very, very clear. Doesn't matter what the question is, but if you have any doubt, immediately get it cleared. Okay, Tripathi, did you understand that this is a positive displacement pump, and if you do not allow release of the pressure, it will rupture the pipe. Any pipe can be ruptured. Normally, those fuel pipes which go from the fuel inject pump to the injector, they are tested to a pressure of 1,000 bar, though the pressure of the injector is set at 350 to 380 bar, the pipes are tested to 1000 bar. And if for some reason the injector does not open, somewhere along the pipe it is going to give way. That is the, what it is. Because ultimately the pressure cannot be held in place. It has to be pushing it up. Other than this, what can happen? If the cam peak will get damaged, the roller which is supporting will get break, broken, Maybe some part of the engine will break. Some part of the pump, which part? I think only the roller and the tappet, that is the place. Because ultimately the roller is rotating on a shaft, a small shaft. And this shaft may break. Because ultimate force is coming over there. And hydraulic pressure can go to any limit. Okay, so let's move on and go on to our next plate. Now we are coming on to a different type of pump and that pump is called a valve controlled fuel injection pump 
and it is used mainly by Suzer and their licensee manufacturer. Suzer, we also have licensee manufacturers like MAN. MAN just as much has uh, licensee manufacturers, so Suzer also has. And the valve control pump consists of a steel block within which passages are machined out to accommodate a simple spring actuated plunger. This plunger is actually a simple, you know, cylindrical body working in tandem with suction and spill valves through push rods. Oh, that's a lot of sentences, a lot of words, a lot of material in that sentence there. Let's read it once again to give a fair understanding. I have diagrams which will become very simple to understand if you follow the few descriptions that are given on this plate. The valve controlled pump consists of a steel block. The steel block is about the size of your laptop length and width and the height is about one span, about one span, nine inches about. So that is the block. And in this block, you have machined passages. There are passages inside which allow to accommodate one plunger. It's like a piston and it's just an ordinary piston. No piston rings, just piston. And this piston, when it works, the lower part of the piston is made in such a way that there are two levers on the sides and these two levers operate two push rods. These push rods operate a suction valve and a spill valve. You see in the Bosch pump you saw we had a suction port and we had a spill port. So if here there are no ports, over here there are valves. And the valves play the same function as the ports. So it becomes easy if you, if you relate the two pumps. In the Salzer, we have suction and spill valve. In the Bosch type, we have suction and spill ports, which are holes inside the barrel. Over here, we have valves. Okay, And these valves are operated by push rods. And these push rods are operated by link rods. And these link rods are connected to the main plunger. So when the plunger moves up and down, the link rods operate the suction and spill valve depending on when it has to be opened and when it has to be closed. Okay. Next is two levers are actuated by the plunger for opening and closing the suction and spill valves. In this case, the beginning of injection period is fixed. Alright. Same like your Bosch pump only. The beginning of injection is a fixed. And that is when the plunger rises and closes the uh, port. It's fixed. That means opening and closing of the suction valve remains fixed. And end of injection is varied depending on the load of the engine. Same as your Bosch pump. At least in principle, it is the same as the Bosch pump. And end of injection is varied depending on the load of the engine. If the load is high, that means it is moving at a higher RPM. The spill valve will close much later to enable more fuel to be injected. Same thing, in your Bosch pump, that stroke of the pump, it continues to deliver and if the load of the engine is very high, then the longest distance from the top edge of the plunger to the helix curve will be opening or stopping the final injection. So similarly, the spill valve here opens after a longer time if the load is high. Okay, now let's have a look at the diagram. And I think we'll spend good time on the diagram because the diagram says it all. Now here is the diagram. I'm going to make it as big as possible so that everybody sees it on a bigger scale. Okay. Now have a look at this diagram. I hope everybody can see it. Faran, can you see the diagram properly? Yes, sir. Good. Now have a look at this. Now this is the steel block. All right. And inside we have passages which are drilled or machined out. And it is machined in three places. One is on the left side, one is central and one is on the right side. The central one has a bigger diameter part machined out. And this is the plunger. What you see is the plunger, it is working inside this hollow space and in this hollow space, a little on top, you have a non-return spring-loaded 
delivery valve. So this delivery valve is actually a means to stop the fuel from top, that means from the fuel injector coming back into the pump. So this part of the fuel is the fuel designated to go into the fuel injector. So this arrowhead shows the path to the fuel injector. Okay, below this delivery valve, we have the plunger. And this plunger has a collar at the bottom and a spring fitted out. See, when the plunger goes up, there has to be some means of putting the plunger down. Huh? So this spring over here helps to push the plunger down. And as it is pushed down, you see at the bottom, you have a tappet. This is called a tappet and this is called a roller. So the roller is fitted with the tappet, which I'll actually resting on the base circle of the cam. So right now, as we see it, the, fist, the plunger is at the bottom dead center, which means the roller is resting on the base circle of the cam. The peak is completely off from the roller. So that is why I say the plunger is at the BDC. Little above the tappet, you have two collars which accommodate two levers. One is on the right side and one is on the left side. This lever is on the other side of the collar, that side. And this one is on this side. So these two levers, if you see, they are resting on a fulcrum for the suction valve. This is a fulcrum and it is a fixed fulcrum as of now. It is a fixed fulcrum and little beyond the fulcrum, you have a push rod. This push rod is actually going into that passage and it is pushing up a valve. This is a valve and is called the suction valve and it has got a spring on it. And you see the push rod and the valve are separate. Can you see the line in between the valve and the rod? So this rod right now is contacting or making contact with the valve and the valve is pushed up and in the open position. So right now this drawing is actually a working drawing with the plunger at the BDC this lever is in such a position that it has lifted up the push rod. And while lifting up the push rod, it has opened the valve. So in the process now, fuel is coming in, filling up the space. It has filled up the space. It has filled up the space above the uh, spill valve also. Just like this suction valve, we have another valve on the right hand side. This valve is called the spill valve. This is also a spring loaded valve. And at the moment, because the pit, our plunger is at BDC, the spill valve is closed position. And this closed position is because of this lever on the right side working on a fulcrum here. And the plunger is at the lowermost position. Likewise, this push rod is also in the lowermost position, being on the left side of the fulcrum. So that is why you see a gap between the valve and the push rod. Okay. Now, in this pump, we have a fixed beginning of fuel injection and a variable end of injection, just like your Bosch pump. In the Bosch pump 2, we had a fixed beginning of injection. And that fixed beginning of injection was when the plunger covered the spill port and the suction port. Then the beginning of injection started. Okay. So similarly, over here, we have a situation where the beginning of the fuel injection is fixed, but the end of injection is varied depending on the load. Okay, I will come to this little later. First, let us see how the pump is working. Now consider the pump going to start with the uh, cam going to rotate in the direction shown and the roller will be now pushed upwards. As it is pushed upward, what will happen? This link rod at the plunger will start going up and because the fulcrum is here, on this side, the push rod will start going down, okay? Because this is a simple uh, link where you have the fulcrum in one position, effort in one direction, and load in the opposite direction. So once the plunger starts going up, the push rod will go down, okay? I hope everybody understands a simple lever, effort, fulcrum, load. You remember in school, so once the plunger starts going up, the link rod on the other end will go down and slowly the valve will come to close. Okay, And this plunger will keep going up till the point this valve closes. Moment this valve closes, it means all the oil on top over here is trapped. 
there is no passage for it to go except one and that is once the pressure is built up this pressure will lift up this delivery valve and allow the oil to go into this passage which is actually to the fuel injector and the pressure keeps building up till such time the spring in the fuel injector gives way that means it overcomes the pressure set by the spring in the fuel injector and the fuel is injected through the injector into the combustion chamber okay so now the valves are closed and the plunger is going up 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 and fuel injection has started that means it has commenced and fuel is being injected and as it keeps going up at some point of time you will see the push rod is also going up because the push rod is on the left side of the fulcrum okay so this lever as it goes up 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 it is also pushing this push rod up this push rod will keep going up keep going up till it makes contact with the valve and moment it makes contact with the valve the valve will open and moment valve opens all this high pressure fluid will be allowed to spill out and that signals the end of fuel injection but it does not mean the plunger has stopped plunger is still going up it will keep going up but no fuel will be injected into the combustion chamber because the stroke effective stroke is over the plunger will keep going up till it reaches the cam peak and then again it will start coming down that means the success, the spill valve is open and the pressure on top will start dropping because the plunger is coming down so this void this space has to be filled up moment this pressure drops this valve will close and no oil from the fuel injector pipeline will come back into this space because this pressure drops the valve as uh, the pressure above the suction valve will also drop and because this pressure is lower than the incoming fuel pressure the valve will open irrespective of the position of this push rod so because the pressure on this side is lower than the pressure on the underside the valve will open of course as the plunger keeps going down 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 this push rod will also keep pushing up the valve to open it even more so then the oil will continue to flow into this passage and the same cycle is repeated all over again now at what point does this push rod of the spill valve open the spill valve it will it depends on the position of this fulcrum okay so this fulcrum will decide the effort distance as in proportional to the load distance sorry you can call, call any one of them load let us say the plunger is the effort this effort and the push rod is load so effort distance is proportional to load distance depending on the ratio of x is to y you see x is the distance from the center to the push rod and the distance from the push rod to the fulcrum is given as y so there is a definite relationship of movement of the push rod relative to the plunger because these distances are in certain proportion now if i change the proportion that means if i increase y or decrease y then at that point of point of time where the push rod will open the valve can be varied it can be varied so now the whole objective is to control the end of injection this controlling the end of injection will determine the quantity of fuel delivered and thereby the load of the engine sorry load of the engine so now that fulcrum is the now movement of that fulcrum over here is the job of the governor and this is moved by means of a eccentric you see eccentric means a shaft whose center is free and near the circumference there is another protruding shaft so moment this shaft is rotated the movement of that extended part will be radial in nature it will not be around its axis but it will be radial in its nature so movement of this eccentric through a bracket over here helps to move this pin in a radial mode in other word the movement of this pin over here can be in the horizontal direction through an arch because the movement of this pin will be through an arch 
but ultimately it is still radial in nature. So the variation of the position of the fulcrum will determine the quantity of actual fuel delivered into the engine. This is ultimately controlled by the governor control. So when the governor moves that lever, it can increase or decrease the quantity of fuel delivered to the engine. Now, I hope some understanding has come about because this is the preliminary explanation of fuel injection through the valve control system. If you have any questions, if you want some clarifications again, do let me know. I will clarify it even further. Remember, it is beginning is fixed because this fulcrum is fixed. But end of injection is being varied by changing the relative position on the lever, thereby giving differential movements of the push rod as compared to the plunger. So that differential movement varies the quantity of fuel ultimately injected into the cylinder, thereby controlling loading of the engine. Paran, any difficulty in understanding? Shiti Jaiswal? No, sir. Okay. If you have any questions, make sure you understand it. And get it clear. Because if you just go away thinking, yes, I have understood it, I am feeling timid about asking any questions, then you are the loser. Don't be a loser here. We want all winners. You have to win. I also have to win. I have to be sure that you have understood. Then, I, then only I will leave the plate. If you have not understood, you ask again. Again, I will clarify. As a brief explanation again, this is the Sulzer fuel pump and it has a plunger centrally located and on either side you have the suction and spill valve and these two valves are operated in conjunction with the movement of the plunger. This movement is achieved through two link rods which operate the push rod on, the, on two fulcrums. The fulcrum for the suction valve is a fixed fulcrum. So when the valve will close and when it will open are fixed timings, fixed positions. You cannot change them. Okay, okay. And this is fixed position, whereas the spill valve opening and closing can be varied by changing the position of the fulcrum of the lever because the movement of the plunger has a definite proportionate movement or with the plunger based on the position of the fulcrum. So if this fulcrum is moved, then the relative position of movement by the push rod and by the plunger will be different. And this variation helps in controlling the quantity of fuel being delivered. Divakar has a question. So what is the mechanism for stopping the fuel for this pump? The mechanism for stopping the fuel of the pump is by the governor. The moment the governor moves, immediately this will move to a position where it will open the spill valve. That's all. Head. So at some position, the spill valve will always remain open. You see, when the thing is going up, this will movement will be such that it will immediately make contact. If the fulcrum is moved very much over here, then what will happen? Sorry, if, the, if it is right move right on the right side more, then the movement of the plunger will move cause the movement of the of the push rod, and that push rod will immediately keep the valve open. So at some position, it will remain always open, even as it starts to move up. Sir, please explain how variable fulcrum working. Okay, Mrityanjay Kumar Rana. Now this variable fulcrum movement is by this uh, eccentric. You see, there is a round section rod here, and there is a pin which is fitted not on the central axis of this rod. It is near the circumference. Okay. So when this rod, this big diameter rod is moved about its axis, then that pin will move in a radial format. format. It will move in a radial format. So it will not be rotating. It will be, you know, arcing in the form of an arc. And this arc is the movement around over here. 
so it will keep moving in this arc. In other words, the position of the fulcrum is changed by the movement of this linkage controlled by the governor. Moment this one is moved up and down, then the position of this uh, pin will shift from left to right in the form of an arc because rotation of this shaft around its axis will cause a movement of this pin in the form of an arc. So that movement of an arc will change the position of the fulcrum, thereby changing the time at which this push rod will be going up and down and by how much. Okay. So when will the suction commence? The suction will commence as soon as the plunger starts moving down. Because moment the plunger moves down, the delivery valve will close because the pressure drop. And moment the plunger moves down, then the volumetric space over here is going to increase. Isn't it? Moment it increases, the pressure here is going to drop. And this pressure being at the top of the valve also will be much less then the pressure which is being supplied to the pump. This is the supply pressure, it comes to 3 bar or 4 bar, whereas the pressure here will be dropping almost to 0 bar. So even if the push rod does not push up the valve, the valve will rise because the pressure below the valve is 3 to 4 bar and on top it is almost 0 bar. So the fuel will immediately start coming in. So there is no scope for any air to come in. There is no scope for any gas to come in. So it will only be liquid coming in. If there is a slight difference in pressure, the pressure from the higher zone will go into the lower zone. So that is the initial part of the fuel coming in. Thereafter, when the plunger still keeps going down, the fuel rack or the fuel lever, the lever over here will push up this rod to keep the valve fully open. All along, the differential pressure was keeping it open. Now the push rod will keep it open even if there is no differential pressure. Even if the pressure is from coming into the pump till on top of the plunger is the same, the valve will still be kept open because the push rod will have kept it open. Okay. So that is why, that is the time when suction will commence. Suction Sir. will commence. Ah, uh, yes. Sir, then what is the role of fixed fulcrum? What is the role of? Sir, then what is the role of fixed fulcrum? Sir, as the pressure is dropping, then it is opening. Sir, the sir role, what? Yes, uh, sir. The pump has also always to be filled up with fluid, with fuel. You cannot have air inside. So the suction valve is made such a way that it will lift moment there is a differential pressure. So the place inside will be full of oil. It is not that the delivery valve is open. Delivery valve was closed and it has kept the oil above the valve filled up, primed. The line is primed with oil. There is no air or gas in the space above the delivery valve because it has immediately shut after injection has stopped. Moment the pressure here drops, the valve will close because there is a spring here. Moment sir, it is closed. Huh? Sir, I am asking, sir, what is the role of fixed fulcrum? What is the role of? Fixed, fixed fulcrum. This plunger? No, sir. Fixed fulcrum. I can't understand what you're saying. Sir, he's what asking what is the role of fixed fulcrum? Fixed fulcrum. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. The role of the fixed fulcrum is to give opening and closing of the valve at the fixed time. When we go deeper into the subject, I will be changing that fulcrum into a moving fulcrum. Moment I make it into a moving fulcrum, you will have a variable suction valve opening. That means I can open the suction valve at a different time as my desire. That means, you see, you remember the timing of the two-stroke engine, 5 degrees before TDC and 15 degrees after TDC is the duration for the fuel injection. All this time for the Bosch pump and for this pump as of now, I have varied the after TDC period. It may be 15 degrees, it may be 12 degrees, it may be 10 degrees. So I am varying this side. But in the Bosch pump as well as this pump, that 5 degrees before TDC is fixed. Now, 
we will be going into the subject deeper and it is called variable injection timing you see when the engine is running at higher loads or higher speeds this timing is not satisfactory the time for which the fuel is delivered is not satisfactory it may be satisfactory for low loads it may be partially satisfactory for mid loads but it is not satisfactory for higher loads so for higher load the beginning of injection and end of injection both have to be varied that is the reason why we have variable injection timing to get the maximum output the maximum benefit of burning fuel into the combustion chamber we must deliver the oil when it is burnt ideally and it is burnt ideally at certain speeds when delivered at a certain time it is burnt ideally at part load condition when delivered at a certain time so that is why during full load condition the time when it has to be delivered is different than in part load condition when the fuel has to be delivered the engine is moving very fast okay at the high load condition so in the high load condition if you deliver the fuel at the same time possibly by the time the piston reaches the bdc the fuel will not have burnt so what do we do we give the fuel a little earlier we give the fuel a little earlier so it starts combusting also a little earlier so by the time the piston goes down all the fuel is burnt so you have got the best benefit of the fuel so that is why under mid load condition the fuel injection timing is partly advanced under full load condition it is advanced fully and in the low load condition it is retarded in fact it is put uh, much later so that is why we need variable injection timing the objective is to burn the fuel in the best possible way to get the maximum benefit you will not get the same benefit at full load condition if you keep the timing fixed so that is why we need to change the timing since the variable fulcrum is being employed to have a variable time of end of delivery so can we use variable fulcrum of course now manohar singh you are thinking in the right direction i am feeling good about myself because i brought you to think on those lines good i am liking it good boy that's it so right now as of now we go to it slowly and as you keep absorbing the subject we will go deeper into the subject and come into a state where the actual practice is in giving variable injection timing this variable injection timing is right going to be shown for your sulzer and once we finish with sulzer we'll show you how the bosch pump timing is also changed that means the beginning of injection is also changed in the bosch pump in the bosch pump when the plunger covers the suction and spill port that is the beginning of injection now we want to change that that will also be changed changing the end of injection is understood because changing of the rotary position of the plunger changing of the helix relative to the spill port is very simple changing the beginning of injection will be what manohar singh has come into variable injection timing but before we go to the next plate if you have any questions on this part this particular diagram and be able to understand nobody has asked me sir what is the idea of having two plugs over here the plugs on top of the suction valve and spill valve it's an important part i have not specifically mentioned here because it does not come into the picture right now but i would like you to know what is the purpose of those two plugs over there you see we need to check when we check at what point is the suction valve opening and what point is the spill valve opening relative to the position of the flywheel in other words relative to the position of the piston of that particular unit this has to be fixed what is the crank angle when the suction valve opens or when the spill valve closes we need to know this so this is done through these two plugs over here we when we are doing this job we have to shut down the engine engine is not running and fuel has been drained out there is no fuel over here or any might be a trace of fuel over there 
So when this plug is opened out, there is no fuel pressure. Fuel pressure is stopped. What we fit over here is a dial gauge. I think everybody knows what is a dial gauge. It is like a clock and it can indicate the movement of the shaft which is at the bottom of the dial gauge. So when the dial gauge is fitted here, the shaft of, at the bottom of the gauge goes and rests on top of the spill valve. Similarly, another dial gauge is put on this one and it is allowed to rest on top of here. This opening is not required. Only we need to know the timing at which the suction valve opens and suction valve closes. So what we do, <clears throat> so uh, sometimes they use a third dial gauge also here to record the point at which the piston is at plunger is at BDC and TDC. So when this dial gauge is making contact here, we rotate the engine on turning gear. And, and on the turning gear when it rotates, it rotates the camshaft and if the camshaft rotates, the cam will actuate this. When the camshaft actuates this, this will start moving up and this will also start moving up. But it will not open the valve. So we need to know at what point the spillage takes place. So as we keep operating this plunger up, up, up to the camshaft, we know on the, on the dial gauge which is fixed in the middle that it is also rotating because the plunger is moving up and pushing that rod up. Now, the moment this dial gauge starts working, we stop the turning gear and then we check the angle on the flywheel. So, we will know immediately at what point of time the fuel is cut off and is it correlating to the governor load indicator. Because when the governor puts a certain load, say 70, at 70, what is the angle at which the spillage takes place. So, with this fuel rack of the governor being considered, we will see at what point of time the spill opens. Likewise, we see also at what point of time the suction valve closes. That is the beginning of injection and this one is the end of injection. When the fuel rack is at a certain position. So these two plugs over here are intended to check the timing of the valve relative to the load indicator on the governor. How is, sir, how sealing is done here in the fulcrum region? Sealing. This is, you see, the pump cannot be in midair. So it is on a stool. And this tool is not being shown to you. This tool is little above the camshaft. And this space is free of any fuel oil coming in. You see this push rod, it has got a sealing arrangement here. And it's got a sealing arrangement here. And any oil that leaks from here is directly got a arrangement. There is not that it does not leak. There is possibility of oil leak from here in case this pump and blanger, blanger and back and uh, housing get worn out. But you know this is one of the safety issues regarding not contaminating the lubricating oil with the fuel oil. This is the region where such a thing happens. Sometimes what they have on this shaft, they have an umbrella, an umbrella, a proper umbrella. It is a fixture that any oil that leaks will fall out of spaces from coming onto the camshaft because the camshaft has lubricating oil continuously being fed over there. Now with the lubricating oil, if the fuel oil comes in, you are going to destroy that lube oil. So you have an umbrella which is fitted onto this plunger shaft over here and what oil falls on the plumber, on the umbrella is collected in a separate bowl and this bowl is led out of the engine to the fuel tank. So any oil leak from the pump is collected in a mold where the lead out is away from the lubricating oil spaces. These are all lubricating oil spaces and these are all fuel oil spaces. So this is a region where contamination of lube oil takes place. And to prevent it, the design of the pump is made in such a way that should any leak take place, that oil will be led in a different path. So that comes under a you know a different subject where you know technicality of the construction detail is concerned. 
So right now we are only worried about how it works. But nevertheless, it's a good question that Mr. Jai Rana has asked, and it is definitely a very relevant subject where we come into contamination of lubricating oil. Lubricating oil is also in our syllabus, and that will be also as important as your fuel pumps and injectors. Okay, so sealing is done. Sealing means prevention. It is no, you cannot seal. If you seal everything, there will be no movement. So that arrangement, there are umbrellas. It's a, it's a structure made in such a way that any oil falls will fall on the umbrella and fall in a different way. It will not be allowed to fall into the camshaft spaces. So that is the design of the whole system. Of course, I cannot show it here. It will become very jumbled up and very confusing. Okay, Mr. Joy, I hope I made some clarification. And Manohar Singh has asked a good question. Manohar also asked a good question. Shall we proceed to the next plate? I think we can. Okay. Now let's read up here. With reference to the diagram given earlier, the suction valve is lifted off its seat when the plunger is at the BDC. That we saw just now. When it is at BDC, the lever lifts up the, plunger, uh, the push rod. Through the push rod. As the plunger moves upward, the suction valve will be lowered onto its seat by the lever. Again, again. Oh, sorry, not this diagram. No, where was he? Sorry, this one. So as the plunger is lifted up, you see the movement of the lever is such that this end of the lever will come down. As it comes down, the push rod will come down and will close the valve on top here. So that will close the suction valve. Okay. So as the plunger moves upward, the suction valve will be lowered onto its seat by the lever. The spill valve remains closed. This is the point at which the fuel injection begins. The plunger continues to rise until it reaches the point where the spill valve opens. Fuel spills back into the suction side of the pump, signaling the end of fuel injection. That means fuel injection has stopped. But the plunger keeps moving up. As the plunger then moves down, now one, one part I have missed out over here, I will continue to over here. After the fuel injection has stopped, it does not mean the plunger moves down. The plunger is still moving up. It has to complete its stroke depending on the cam position. It has to pass the cam peak and then only the plunger will start coming down. Okay. So as the plunger then moves down with stroke, the if I write everything, there will be num too many plates. As the plunger moves down with stroke, the pressure difference across the suction valve, that means the pressure which is at 3 to 4 bar which is fed to the engine, and the almost zero pressure which is caused with the plunger coming down, causes the valve to lift off its seat, which allows fuel to enter into the pump barrel. Further down the stroke, the suction valve lifts even more as it is pushed up by the push rod on the lever. I think this is the explanation which I was giving you earlier verbally. Now I have given it in writing also. So if you need to refer to it, you can always refer to it. Okay. Okay. Let's go to the next plate. The volume of fuel delivered is controlled by the spill valve eccentric shaft. Okay, this is what uh, that question was. Please explain the variable fulcrum working. Mr. Jai Rana. Okay, that was his question here. The volume of fuel delivered is controlled by the spill valve eccentric shaft. This is the point of the fulcrum that is moved to change the timing of the spill valve opening and closing. Okay, if the valve closes later, more fuel is injected. In other words, bigger load on the engine. If the valve opens earlier, then less fuel is injected. That is less engine load. I hope with enjoy this is reasonably clear. At all instances, it is the end of fuel injection that is varied to control the quantity of fuel injected and thereby load on the engine. The beginning is fixed as of now. 
the beginning is fixed. The beginning of fuel injection is fixed. It is only the end of injection that has been controlled to control the quantity of fuel being delivered. Okay. Now, if we are intended to run the engines better and more economically, ultimately everything is economics, and economically we shall need to control the beginning of injection and the end of injection. Sorry. We shall need, how come you not finished this? We shall need to control beginning of injection and end of injection. I missed this. Oh, yeah. We shall need to control both. Let us write both. Both. Start. Both means beginning of injection and end of injection. Now here is a little revisionary. This is the working steps of this which I have not explained to you earlier. Plunger reciprocates as cam passes over the roller. So this is the cam and the plunger will reciprocate. Go up and down depending on what is the position of the cam. Movement operates two levers to open or close suction and spill valve through put rod. This movement operates two levers. This is one lever, this is one lever. To operate the push rods which will open the two valves. Duration of opening or duration of open or close position of the two valves is dependent on the eccentric fulcrum which is movable. Okay, here it is movable, here it is fixed. So, he says the duration of how long it is opened is dependent on the position of these fulcrum. Variation in this time duration determines the quantity of fuel injected into the combustion chamber of the unit. So, variation in how, when this push rod will open, will, de will decide how much of fuel is injected into the chamber. The eccentric is operated through a lever from the governor. So this is the eccentric what you see and this is operated by a lever from the governor. This is an isometric view. So I have tried to make it as understandable as possible. Remember this little pin here is not on the center of this shaft, big diameter shaft. It is near the circumference. So when this shaft is rotated about its axis, the pin will not move in the in a rotary movement. It will be moving in an arc, in the form of an arc. This articulated movement changes the position of the fulcrum, which will change the time at which this push rod will open or go up or down. I hope this part is understandable. Um, I can't explain better. The eccentric is operated through a lever from the governor. In this case, only spill valve operation is varied to give inject, end of injection control. In this diagram, what you see, only the end of injection is under control. Okay. I hope so much is clear. Next. Ah. Uh, this diagram should have come later. Let's start here. Now, variable injection timing. I will have to change that diagram because I have not gone so far with the other sections also. Variable injection timing. Now, we are coming to the real scheme of things. The first part was just the explanation to give you an introduction. In the real pump, you will have both sides control. So, variable injection timing. This means varying the beginning of fuel injection and also varying the end of fuel injection. Why is it necessary to get the mainly, oh, oh I should have written that, mainly ideal combustion process inside the combustion chamber? Because at full load speed or higher. Somebody saying something. Okay, so uh, if it is at a higher speed, you need to inject the fuel earlier. If it is at a lower speed, you need to inject the fuel later. So that is the basic concept of variable injection timing. The quantity control. 
the amount of fuel injected per stroke is usually accomplished by varying the effective stroke of the fuel pump that we have already seen this can be done by varying the beginning of delivery varying the end of delivery varying the beginning and end of delivery all three ways we can change the effective stroke if we close the suction valve earlier when the plunger is moving up because the spill valve is already closed we can vary the quantity of fuel and then again if the if the beginning is fixed we can change the end of injection by varying the time when the end of delivery is controlled then again we can change the effective stroke by varying both the valves and varying beginning and end of the fuel delivery is not only controlling the quantity of fuel also varying the time when it is being injected you get the point so that is also very necessary so let's see so we have varying the beginning of delivery varying the end of delivery and varying the beginning and end of fuel delivery the bosch principle regulates the end of the effective stroke by the helical groove that you have understood this method gives fuel injection early in the cycle at light load and also gives higher efficiency but also leads to higher firing pressure okay the key to obtaining uh, obtaining optimum peak pressure at higher load is to control the beginning of fuel injection too that means you have to give it much earlier okay largely used for man and bmw engine and their licensee manufacturers that means the bosch principle is largely is used for man and bmw engines and their licensee manufacturers modern man and bmw engines have arrangements to control the beginning and end of fuel injection okay this is just what we studied about sulzer it also applies to bosch in the valve type of fuel pumps now we are discussing the valve type of fuel pumps which is in sulzer it is also possible to vary the beginning and end of fuel injection initially the spill valve operation was controlled that we saw already resulting in constant beginning with variable end of delivery that is all would be explained in the interest of fuel economy both valves are now controlled to give variable beginning and variable end of delivery the whole purpose ultimately is fuel economy and that because of fuel economy we need to control the beginning of injection as well as end of injection okay now here we are a variable injection timing vit what is the objective what is the objective of changing the timing the objective is to retain the maximum cylinder pressure in the upper load range of 85 200% okay this variation now more than this i like to add a little bit this variation is only effective beneficial advantages at this particular load anything above 70% at the higher load region it is not beneficial advancing at the lower load region it doesn't make sense it is beneficial at the higher load region that means if you can get the efficiency or the peak pressure at 85% load of what you will get at 100% load you are definitely going to save a lot of fuel isn't it so that means the peak pressure at 100% load if you can get it at 85% load then definitely you are going to get more power at reduced fuel so that is what the whole purpose is to retain the maximum cylinder pressure in the upper load range at 85% to 100% that means when it is at 85% to 100% the peak pressure is equal to 100% the maximum so that is what we try to get what is the consequence the consequence is the specific fuel consumption in the upper load range is reduced that means fuel consumed in grams per precocious per hour is reduced considerably 
in the upper load range. And most of the time, the ship is running at the upper load range. From Mumbai to, let us say, Mumbai to US, going via Cape Town. That engine speed, that fuel rack is fixed for weeks. Suppose it takes four weeks to reach, let's say, New Orleans, Mumbai to New Orleans. That fuel rack is fixed at 85%. So the engine is running at maximum peak pressure continuously. So that is why we have the fuel advantage. If you keep maneuvering, that time you will not get. If you are maneuvering to low load, part load, full load, again part load, low load, full load, then you will not get any advantage. It is a continuous movement at a higher load. So the specific fuel consumption in the higher load range is reduced and the greatest reduction is in the 85 to 90 percent load range. This is the range at which the engines mostly run at during service. At me, at it should not be there, it should be avoided or mostly run during their service. What is the process? In order that the thermal efficiency and hence the specific fuel consumption be maintained at the optimum level, you see, thermal efficiency is the total amount of energy from the fuel converted into work, so that also has to be kept high. And if that is kept high, the specific fuel consumption will be reduced. So that is why thermal efficiency is very important. Other, most of the energy from the fuel will be going out as heat energy through the cooling medium. That is not required. You need to keep the engines also hot, as hot as possible, and at the same time comfortable. Necessary to maintain maximum cylinder pressures as the engine load is reduced from 100%. If the engine load is 100%, that means the maximum fuel is going. So you need to keep that maximum peak pressure when the load is on 85%. So you are getting the benefit of the peak pressure at 100% at 85%. Okay. Sorry, let's have that other diagram, which I showed by mistake. Yeah. Now, this is the fuel pump effective stroke without variable injection timing. See that beginning of injection was being controlled here. Okay. And then the fuel was being cut off here. When it was on 25% load. Likewise, a little more load up to here. Little more load up to here. Little more load up to here. But the fuel plunger kept going up, up, up. This is the point the fuel plunger starts going down. And the total lift of the plunger is from here to here. And the effective stroke from here to here, if it is on load load, from here to here, if it is on middle load, from here to here, as the total on main load. And you see that fulcrum which I showed you, let's make it a little bigger. That fulcrum which I showed you was movable, is ultimately moved by the governor. And here is the diagram which shows that fulcrum is being moved from one side to another by means of a linkage connected to the governor. So this is your governor and here, this governor is working without variable injection timing. With the beginning of injection that is fixed, but the end of injection being varied by means of this eccentric. And this is the representative graph for this kind of operation. Okay, so this is the diagram in with the governor showing you how the link rod is moved through a linkage mechanism and that's how it is okay and this is the graphical representation at various loads with the beginning of injection being fixed now in the very injection timing we can have at the higher load this one will be longer next one will be a little shorter next one will be a little shorter and next one will be a little shorter so that will be under variable injection timing. So this was our total objective, consequence and process. Next what we have is the benefits that are uh, uh, achieved. 
So this is accomplished by varying the timing of the fuel injection as the engine load is reduced. See the graph here. Yeah. <coughs> you see here, this is where the difference in the beginning of fuel injection. Without VIT, it is fixed at zero. With variable injection timing, it is increased at 85% load to a maximum of 2 degrees. You see that 85% it is increased to a 2 degrees. From 100 degrees, it is advanced, advanced, advanced. This is advanced and this down below is retard. So this is advanced with a positive and retard with a negative. So this is the graphical representation. If it is at full load at 100, the advancing is this in this direction till it is maximum of 2 degrees. Thereafter, again, it is reduced to 0 degrees if it comes to below 65-70%. So this is the angle shown as difference in beginning of fuel injection as compared to without VIT and with VIT. In this case, it is showing you the reduction in the specific fuel consumption. This is the normal amount of specific fuel consumption. And this, how the specific fuel consumption is ideal at 85%. This is the maximum amount of specific fuel consumption reduction when the load is at 85%. This diagram gives the fuel savings. One is with VIT, one is without VIT. So this is the difference where we have in fuel savings. And this is the diagram which is most important. This is a graph which is showing you at what point of time the difference in angle starts. So at 85%, you are getting the peak pressure of 100%, the maximum cylinder pressure with 85% load or power. So that from 85% to 100%, you get a continuous maximum cylinder pressure. So that gives your maximum torque or ultimate power to your crankshaft. So at 85% what peak pressure you are getting, you are supposed to get it at 100% without VIT. That means the fuel consumption at 100% would be giving you this 100% peak power. But now with fuel consumption at 85% load, you are getting the same peak power. So this is achieved through advancing of your fuel injection through this graphical representation. But this advancing is only 2 degrees, just 2 degrees. Okay. So the advancing or retarding is usually limited to plus 2 degrees and minus 2 degrees. That is all. In fact, it is actually minus 1 degree. Nobody does retarding. Uh, retarding will be when the fuel quality is super good. But now with the fuel quality being poor, the advancing is made, being made more and more. Over here you see the advancing is allowed up to 2 degrees only, but some engines, in fact Sulzer allows the chief engineer to have that prerogative, that means it is his right, that he can advance it even further by about 2 degrees more, but not many chief engineers take that initiative. That initiative has to be taken if the quality of the fuel is so poor that the peak pressures are not being obtained in spite of advancing by the governor. If the peak pressures are not being advanced in spite of the governor advancing by 2 degrees, then the chief engineer has the prerogative of increasing or rather advancing the fuel injection another 2 degrees. I think 1 degree or 2 degrees. He doesn't go more than 1 degree. After that, it becomes not worthy. I don't know what will happen after that. If you keep advancing, then the fuel will not burn at all. There is a limit to how much of advancing you can give. You know, uh, somebody might uh, put up a question. Sir, if you advance by 10 degrees, what will happen? 10 degrees, then before the fuel engine can, piston can reach midway, you're injecting the fuel. It will not burn. It will not burn at all. This timing is a very critical factor for the engine, the fuel delivery, compression, ignition temperature, going over the cam. These are very critical points. And studies have made to the minutest point to get the maximum benefit. And that maximum benefit is achievable through this variable injection timing. The fuel savings are significant 
as Pmax is maintained during most of the ship's operation period. That means they are giving the maximum peak pressure to give the required torque on the crankshaft. Okay. Next, what we see is the VIT characteristics. See, now here is, I have made this graph and I will try to explain. This is your TDC, all right? And say 10, 5 degrees before TDC is where fuel is normally injected, okay? Normally injected at full power. So, suppose this is the full power. Now, as the a, a fuel is advanced, this is the advancement that is made. That means before 5 degrees, it comes to about 6 degrees up to 7 degrees. So, 7 degrees before TDC, you are injecting the fuel when the load is at 75. 75% 75 of the load, it is got 2 degrees advancement from 5 degrees, which is the normal level or at full load. So, as you keep advancing at 75% is the maximum benefit you can get as per this graph. It's usually up to here, which is this part of the graph will be more or less straight. So, at 85%, you will get the maximum benefit. Thereafter, below 75, the advancing is reduced to it comes back to its normal around 50% of the load. Below 55, near 25% of the load, it has to be retarded a little. So, this retarding is also possible in some of the engines, but mostly on in practice, we don't touch it. We don't touch it. What the governor does is set by the manufacturers and we don't touch it. So, this advancing is done by means of the governor linkage. This part is not done by the chief engineer or by manual means. The advancement of injection timing continues till about 65 to 70 degrees. Thereafter, the injection is retarded. It is not due. Due means the. The injection is retarded. Figures show that 25% engine load injection is retarded in relation to full load timing. So, this is the full load timing 5 degrees before TDC. Below 25%, it is given the possibility of advance of retarding. That means the engine is so slow that you don't need to inject the fuel so quickly. You can inject it much later. Okay. Fuel regulation without VIT, end of injection control. In the fuel regulation without VIT, the beginning of injection is constant with respect to TDC over the entire load range, i.e. closing point of suction valve is constant. The end of injection is variable. How did this page come into this place? This page shouldn't be there. This page is not supposed to be there. Okay. Oh, I've got it repeated here. It has got repeated. Okay. This page is not required. Let me delete it. Okay. This page everybody understood. Let us go on to this. So, this is the page that we were supposed to continue after this page. From here, we go on to this page. Variable injection timing continues. With VIT, fuel regulation is so arranged that the beginning of the fuel injection is advanced in the upper load range. Let me make it in bold. It is not in the low, sorry. In the upper load range. In order to retain maximum cylinder pressures at the maximum allowable values. Maximum allowable values means the components must not be stressed beyond their limits. So that is also has to be taken into consideration. Maximum cylinder pressure doesn't mean endless limit. It has to be within the limit to keep the components also under safe stress levels. And the stress levels is not limited to only the combustion chamber. It is also limited to your bearings. The bearing should not get excessive forces arising out of the maximum cylinder pressure. I had explained to earlier what is cylinder knocking or diesel knocking. That knocking is exceptional high pressure on top of the piston, which is like a hammer blow on top of the piston, which in turn affects the bearings. The crosshead bearing, bottom end bearing, and main bearing. 
So if you have excessive pressure acting suddenly, it amounts to knocking. And that is very damaging. You see, you can put a hammer on top of a surface and there is some pressure on it. But if you drop the hammer on the surface, it has much more of impact. The same thing happens here. If the pressure rises suddenly, the force is enormous. So this is done by varying the closing of the suction valve. Okay. So the maximum cylinder pressure can be done by varying the closing of the suction valve. A reference diagram. The governor moves the link. Ah, now is the next very critical diagram and this will be the last. Oh, oh. okay. It's 11 o'clock. But I will show you the diagram where beginning and end of injection are both controlled by the governor. But before we go to the diagram, it's a little complicated diagram, but I've drawn it, making it as simple as possible for you to understand and possibly able to draw. The governor moves linkage 1, crank lever and regulating linkage 3, which controls the opening point of the spill valve end of injection. While the eccentric rod 4, depending on the momentary engine load. The cam 6 is simultaneously moved around the axis A by the linkage 5. The raised profile of the cam, I will come back to this because this is Greek. Without the diagram, this is Greek. The raised profile of the cam is forced to move along the fixed roller 7 and hence move the linkage 8 around the pivot B by an amount equal to the cam lip which alters the position of the eccentric 10. This in turn changes the closing position of the suction valve beginning of injection. Simultaneously, the opening of the spill valve end of injection will be correspondingly advanced via linkage 8, crank lever 2, regulating in 3 and eccentric shaft 4. Thus any influence of the governor output and cylinder lubrication will be avoided. Okay, let us go to the diagram. This is actually the diagram should have come somewhere in the middle. Now here is the diagram which shows the suction valve control as well as the Let's make it as little bigger as possible. Okay, now the diagram is as big as possible I can make it. Now this is something you are familiar with. Only addition is that the suction valve side, the cam, uh, the sorry, the eccentric has been added. Previously this fixed fulcrum. This was a fixed fulcrum and this was the moving fulcrum. And this moving fulcrum, I showed you in that diagram where it was connected to the governor. Now here, you have two link rods. One is for the suction, one is for the spill. There are two rods, which is three and nine coming from the pump. And both are interlinked in such a way through a set of linkages with the governor at one position. See, now this governor, this is the governor and this is the arm of the governor which moves the arm either from 0 up to 10. This scale 0 to 10 is the load indicator. Possibly when it moves from 0 to 5, 3, 4 over here, up to here, there will be not much of advancement of the suction valve. But when it moves beyond that amount, when it moves beyond that amount, the linkages are so calculated and so proportioned that the advancement of suction and spill valve delay is in line with the requirements of 75%, 85%, 90% load. So these links that you see are all calculated values. The angles, uh, Lengths, etc., all calculated values. Okay. Now let us say this uh, load indicator moves downward. It gives some fuel. So this link number one will move downward. This movement of the link will cause this one to move upwards because this is hinged at A. Okay. If it is hinged at A, what will happen? It will immediately move this cam over here in a slot and there is a pin here. This also is an eccentric here. This full cam will move on the basis of this curvature here. If this curvature moves here, 
what will happen this will cause the entire uh, link rod which is filed to move in a direction in line with the link rod moment it moves in the direction of the link rod what will happen this number 2 will also move moment it moves this number 3 will change moment number 3 and 4 changes the position of the fulcrum for the spill rod will change so then what happens then the time at which the spill will open will change similarly as this one changes this link rod is also connected to the bottom one here simultaneously this link rod will also change to change the position of the fulcrum at 10 thereby changing the position of opening or closing of the suction valve so you see this governor with one link rod when it moves through a series of links you have movement of the suction valve as well as the spill valve so this movement of the spill valve and suction valve will change the entire timing period and it largely depends on what is the load indicator on the governor the load indicator is basically from 0 to 10 from 0 to 2 or 3 there won't be much of changes but after 3 and 4 and maybe 5 the movement will be enormous and this enormous movement will cause the linkage movements to be here and these linkage movements will ultimately cause a simultaneous movement of the eccentric for the spill valve and for the suction valve and this will ultimately give you a variation in the beginning of injection and end of injection see because there are so many link rods here you at number 11 you will see a pneumatic piston this pneumatic piston is always under a pressure this pressure is a mild pressure not much and this pneumatic piston keeps a pressure on the link rod and this pressure enables that link rod to remain in a steady position otherwise what will happen your yeah, all the links will start rattling from side to side so to keep that entire system of link rod pressed in position this pneumatic piston is kept against this link rod it's a combination of links levers movements you see this lever is not two separate levers actually I, the mistake should have been i should have made it. this is a l shaped lever this l shaped lever when this one moves down this is going to move this way immediately immediately this will move suppose this link rod number 1 moves down what will happen this l shaped lever will move in the direction anti clockwise moment it moves anti clockwise your spill valve your spill control takes into effect moment it takes into effect the end of injection is controlled at moment this rod is pushed downward this one will move downward to cause this to move upwards moment it moves upwards what does it mean that means this pinion will be moving in this slot over here this movement in the slot will cause this entire cam to move in the um, uh, push direction in the pure direction it pushes up because if it pushes up what will happen the this point will be pushed up and it will be affecting this particular ground moment it is pushed this one will rotate in this direction so that means what will happen when this goes up this thing will come down faster that will it will close earlier see moment this goes down this will affect this one also and it will affect this one also simultaneously okay i think this is a little this will take a little time to absorb but the explanation to this is given in this one yeah reference diagram governor moves linkage 1 crank lever 2 and regulating linkage 3 which controls the opening point of the spill valve okay let's go to that diagram the moment link rod 1 is opened it will move link rod this l shaped lever at this this is the l shaped lever the moment it moves downward this rod this point is going to move towards the right moment link rod 3 moves towards the right it is going to change the position of the fulcrum at 4 so that is the spill valve control okay sorry uh for depending on the momentary engine load 
cam 6 is simultaneously moved around the axis A by the linkage 5. Cam 6. This is your cam 6. It is simultaneously moved about the axis. Moment this is moved downward, this point is the point where it will rotate. Moment it moves, this will move along with this slot here. And this will cause the entire horizontal movement of the link rod 9. The raised profile of the cam is forced to move along the fixed roller 7 and hence move the linkage 8 around the pivot B. And hence move the linkage 8, this is the linkage 8, around the pivot B. So the whole thing is going to swivel from the left hand side to the right or right hand side from the left depending on the curvature of this clock here. Moment it moves in this or that direction, number 9 link rod will be moved to cause a change in the position of the fulcrum at 10. Okay, we will keep it at 33 as of now. We are finished with today's class. We will try to continue in next class next. I will give this lecture on the email. You all do uh, read it up on the instructions and try to follow. And thereafter, we will go over it again. I know it is a little tough, this part of the variable injection timing. But then there is something even beyond variable injection timing. It is called super variable injection timing. But we will not go into that as it is beyond our syllabus. And further explanation to the VIT will be done in the next class. Okay, so that will be all for today. And I am stopping my presentation. If you have any questions, I would suggest first you read through that class lecture once again. Make yourself a little more familiar with variable injection timing and then ask the question. Right now, you have not yet absorbed the subject matter to the point of asking more questions on variable injection timing. And from my part, one or two plates have become extra which I need to delete. So I will delete them. It takes time to make these plates and with the objective of making it as clear as possible. So I will try to improve on this for the other sections too. Till then, bye-bye. Take care. Thank you, sir. Okay.